Um, my wife was here last week speaking to you guys. Lisa. And Lisa was speaking about, her job was to talk about Mary. Um, excuse me for a second. I, it's... Ooh. I like it better down here. I do. Up there, it's like, man, the spotlight is on you. You're doing this. You can't see anything up there. This is where I want to talk from. So my wife was talking about Mary last week, remember? And she made you drink, or a couple of people drink out of those glasses that were... Yes, what do you want to say? That was you. Okay. So people avoided the glasses that looked pretty messed up, didn't they? And they only wanted something to drink out of the clean vessels. So my wife was trying to emphasize the point that Mary was a vessel ready to be used. Yeah, she was really ready. And you guys, really, um, and most Bible historians would put Mary's pregnancy at about 14 or 15. And listen, and Joseph, who I'm supposed to be talking about, he probably was around 17 to 19. So it would probably be like a middle schooler with uh, a high schooler about to graduate. So, but listen, these guys were, and I will say this, women, girls mature a lot faster than boys, don't they? Yes. So Mary, Mary was just, yes, she was just starting. Give me your attention. Come on. Calm down. So listen up. Um, these two people from really that age decided to get married and to have this baby and then to start traveling by themselves, all the way up one side of Israel, all the way down to the other side, and even into another foreign country. What I want to emphasize right now, what my wife is trying to make the point, was being a receptacle, being a dispenser, being ready for God. Because both of them were. The Bible says that Joseph was a righteous man. He was a good guy. Good. A teenage boy or, you know, a later guy you could look at and say, man, that, that's a godly kid. That kid must have a youth group someplace. He talks about God. He doesn't, he's just a good example. And that's, that's who Joseph was. But I want to tell you this, that he fought, he fought a good fight to get to that point because the fights that you guys fight are not necessarily physical ones. You guys aren't in the UFC. You're not duking it out physically with everybody every day. But you have these battles. You have these battles between good and evil, don't you? You have these thoughts. You have these things going on. You are containers. And every day, man, you guys fill the container with something. Every day you put more and more stuff in it, whether it's through your eyes, what you're looking at, what you see when you look at somebody else, what you're looking for, what you desire to look at over and over again, what you concentrate on. You, get it, you also receive stuff through your ears, what you're listening to. Now, sometimes the music out there is just, it's just, the words just are bad. The beat's good. They, they've got, they know how to catch you with that rhythm. They know what you like and what's current. But, man, they put those words in there, and whether you like it or not, whether you're thinking about it or not, that stuff's all going into the receptacle, and it's just piling up and piling up. What you saw is piling up. Sometimes what you put in your mouth. What you're eating, what you're taking in, affects you. You guys got all kinds of ways that information comes into the receptacle. And if too much bad stuff is in there, what's, what eventually is going to come out is, is bad stuff. And, it's not, it's not, and if God's looking down on somebody who claims to be one of his children, and he's looking at it, so he's probably saying, I'm not God, I'm not going to say what he's thinking, but I'm thinking, I, I really can't use that right now. There's no way that that is an example of what I want anybody else to see right now. So I'm going to have to hold off on that right now. Now, you can, you can clean the thing up. You can just start. It's going to take a while to flush all that out, but you can do that. But at your age right now, middle school, this is why I'm excited about being here at middle school, because you're just, just a short ways away from high school where it's even more pressure to do and say and see and hear and do things. It's just more. If you can get something down now, a relationship with God now, I, I don't know where he can take you. I've, this is one thing I've always noticed about teenagers and stuff like that, because I've been teaching for a while. I've noticed that 
once they go down a path that's not good, the end is very predictable. It's so predictable. You know, you're not getting along with your parents, you're not getting along with anybody else, you're getting in trouble here, there, there, and it's just the same old stuff over and over again. But if people who do things God's way, their, their paths are totally unpredictable. You saw a video last week, my wife started this thing off, with my daughter doing a fashion show. Okay, do you remember seeing that? Some people do or not. My daughter took off, she had a bad relationship with a guy, she couldn't hang around him anymore because he lived in our neighborhood. I think he slashed two of her tires, you know, one one day and one the next, because it didn't end very well. He just showed this bad side of him. He, like, flips off and gets angry. Like, he held it in for quite a long time. Then all of a sudden, she saw this monster come out and said, like, no, 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 that ain't happening. So she took off to Hawaii because my wife has a cousin that lives there. So she was there for a month, and what she did in a month she went to a coffee shop and sat there, and every day, and there were other people there, and she met a couple girls, and God supplied Christian girls there. This was so bizarre. They started talking. They had a lot in common. They said, hey, why don't we get our money together this summer, go back out, come back out here and live. We'll just run a place and do that. And my daughter worked her butt off all summer, saved everything, and the other girls made a commitment and did it too, and all of them got together. They rented a place. And she was there. Now, things, things, well, she was a waitress. She taught some painting classes. She did some stuff. And all this time, she's loving the Lord. She just, I know she does. I know her heart, the way she talks. But COVID came. She lost her waitressing job because the restaurant wasn't doing good. Uh, the painting thing was very sparse because people weren't gathering together to paint anymore. And so what she did was this. She said, like, oh, my goodness, I have a couple paintings. You know what I'll do? And somebody gave her the idea, why don't you make a sticker out of that? Why don't you make a sticker out of that painting? So she goes and makes a sticker. And then she made two or three other stickers from paintings of, of animals that live in Hawaii, like a shark or a whale or a squid or something. And she made them. And then she would go to a flea market. Anybody been to flea markets? They have little booths? Yeah. So she set up her little booth at the flea market, and she was selling stickers. Stickers. And she said, hey, man, this is pretty cool. I wonder what else... I wonder what else I could do. So she went to different surf shops all around Hawaii, to the North Shore, to, I, I can't even name the place, in Maluahiki Mahave. I don't even know, I don't even know how to say half these Hawaiian names where she goes. But she goes all around the island of Oahu. This is where Pearl Harbor is. This is where Waikiki, Honolulu. She goes there and she starts selling her stickers to surf shops. And they sell. And then she makes a connection, and she's selling them in gift shops in the airports. You go to the airport in Hawaii on most of those islands, and if you walk into a gift shop, she'll, there's a surfboard there that she painted, and she stuck her stickers in these little plastic trays. And for $4, anybody can afford a $4 sticker. So she said, well, except you, you don't have, you have money to buy a sweater or anything. I'm just so sad for you. Okay, so we'll take an offering for you. Anyhow, so... And now she's in their airports, and she had a bright idea. Hey, I'm going to put, uh, I, want, I want to get uh, people with who have um, old clothes. I'm going to uh, go to flea markets, get them, and I'm going to get people to do, photographers to do pictures, and we're going to stick them on the clothes, and I'm going to paint around them, and we're going to have a fashion show. And if you remember that thing, man, there were like four years ago, she only knew one person. God blessed her, and I, I did not see this coming <laughs> And I panned, I took that video, and I panned everybody yelling her name, we love you, Summer, we love you, Summer. And I'm panning the whole crowd, and I'm like, <laughs> this, is, this is amazing. God has blessed her more than, and in a way that, okay, I'm an artist. My son is a better artist than me, and my daughter kind of struggles with realism, but she can paint these funky, cool things with the Hawaiian vibe. And I never expected her to be the artist, the successful artist selling stuff in the family. But God does that type of stuff to a ready vessel. And sure, she called me from, like, um, bus stops where she had missed the bus going to work. She had to skateboard to work sometimes. She missed the bus sometimes. She had to walk sometimes. And she, I just missed the bus. I got to walk all this way. Can you stay on the phone with me? Because she doesn't know anybody. 
And so she went through the tough times, but she still stayed faithful. Mary and Joseph are just young people, but they're ready to, to do the work. They're, they, they're ready. Your life is going to be so predictable if you choose that other way, that bad path, that, that, that one that you know in your heart is wrong, that one you know, hey, I shouldn't be listening to this music. I shouldn't be watching that. I know I shouldn't. Quit serving the creation and serve the creator. Does that make sense? Because everything out there is something, a part of creation. It's not God himself. Now, I'm going to give you, that was my little sermonette, but now I'm going to give you the trials, and I'm going to show you where Joseph and Mary went. Wait, 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 wait. before I show them, I'm going to show you a map in a second. Let me just give you the story here. The angel comes to Mary, says, you're going to have a baby. She goes, oh, my goodness, how's that going to happen? Okay, so we got that. She takes off for three months and visits her cousin. As soon as she gets to her cousin, her cousin is six months already pregnant because pregnant, she's an older lady with a, a baby, and this baby will be John the Baptist, if you ever heard of him. Nope, you didn't? Okay, well, hang in there, read your Bible, you'll hear all about him. So here we go. So she comes back three months later to Joseph and her family. They're watching her come down the road, and there's a baby bump. We're not even... And Joseph is like, his jaw drops, like, how, why, where, when, what, what's going on here? And his world is rocked because he honestly, honestly, truly loves her. And for her to break his heart like that and obviously be, be with somebody else on behind his back is just heartbreaking. And he, his friends, some of his friends might be telling him, hey, you know, you could take her to court on this. Because our system says that if she does that, you can have her stoned to death. You can actually have her killed. If you really want to press the issue, you could do it. And you'll never see her again in town, man. She made a fool out of you. But he didn't go that route. He loved her. He said he decided to put her away quietly and get a divorce. See, they're actually married. Betrothal is like a marriage. They just haven't uh, gone through the ceremony and started living together. But they're actually, so he has to get a divorce now. So while he's thinking about that, an angel comes to him and says, hey, hey, Joseph, no, what's inside of her is of God. And this is going to be a savior. You're going to call his name Jesus. Be cool. Everything's good. So he wakes up and he instantly says, that's it. We're going we're gonna, to, you're my wife. We're going we're, we're gonna to make the, the best of this. So would you please turn on that map now? From this point here, from this point, they're way up, they're living in Nazareth, that upper town. Do you see that one way up there? That's their hometown. That's where he's trained to be a carpenter and everything's going down. They expected this big wedding, but it ain't happening. Because right now, the Roman government has says, everybody who's, who's of the lineage, who's got an ancestry, you have to go back to the town of your ancestry. They both come from the line of David, and his line comes out of Bethlehem. So he packs her up on the mule or the donkey, whatever, and they go all the way down from number one, see that one to the left, all the way down to Bethlehem. That's an 80-mile trip. She's with child. He probably is freaking out, like, what am I going to do if she starts having the baby on the road? What's going to happen? I, but he's not doing that. He's got, it on, he's got the situation under control. He knows what to do if that ever happens. I wouldn't have to. I'd be like, oh, blah, blah. no, give me a word. Anyhow, so they go all the way down there. She has, this is where she has the baby. Pro okay, wait, I got to back up just for a second. Probably before he left, a star appeared over Bethlehem because, because people a thousand miles away saw the star in the sky and they said, there's a king being born. Our astronomers say that this is, this is something that's big is happening. There's some, something big happening. we got to go to it. So they packed up this huge caravan, and they were going to go all the way. They're headed for the start, about 1,000 miles. They have to travel. He takes this 80-mile trip. Do you know how far 80 miles is? That's, I looked it up today. It's like, you know how many miles a straight line to Ocean City from here is? 85 miles. You would get up, go outside here, get on a donkey, and start walking toward Ocean City. 85 miles. You know, <laughs> I don't know how long it took. it took. It took long enough for them. As soon as they get down to Bethlehem, they're looking for a place to stay. Everybody's in town to pay their taxes. It's crowded. There's no place else. 
There's a place in this, hey, I got a barn out back. You can have the baby out there. So they do. They go out back. They put some straw in the feeding trough. She has the baby. They put the baby there. Shepherds come. They, they, they say, hey, man, this is great. And from this point, he decides to stay there. He stays there for 40 days. The baby has to be trip number two. They go up to Jerusalem to dedicate the baby. Stuff happens there. I don't even want to tell you. It's all, it's all good. Step number three, they come back to Bethlehem. They stay in Bethlehem. The kid's about two or three. Jesus is about two or three years old. The Magi, those guys who started that trip a thousand miles ago, finally show up. They go to Jerusalem, and they talk to the King Herod, and they say, hey, we heard there's a king being born. We want to be part of it. And Herod's like, oh, man, no, not another king. I'm the king, uh, but hey, let me check into it. So he goes to his wise men. He says, okay, guys, what's up with this? Yeah, it's there. The star's there. <laughs> there's a king. Man, you guys didn't tell me about this? Okay, well, I'll, let me I'll be right back. He goes over to his, the wise men and says, hey, listen, as soon as you find the baby, tell me, because I want to worship him too. Please let me know where he is so I can come and do that. And they go, oh, sure, great. That sounds fantastic. So they go to Bethlehem. They present their gifts. They give them three gifts. Everything's great. That night, they're told, the Magi are told, you've got to go back another way. Don't go to Herod. He's up to no good. Just head back. It also, the angel also tells Joseph, hey, Joseph, get out of town quick. Head down into Egypt. Now, some, one of my friends said probably they used the gift money, the gifts, cashed them in, and used that money to pay for their trip down there and to stay down there. And they were told, stay down there until we find out that Herod's dead. So the next time Joseph hears from the angel, and he's heard three times from the angel, he, the angel says, okay, you're clear to go back. So he goes back from Egypt. Now, we're probably talking 200 miles plus. He goes back, but he avoids Bethlehem because Herod's evil son is taken over. He's even worse than his dad. And he goes back to his hometown, and that's where he stays, sets up his business, and everything's groovy. Okay? Now, I'm ending with this. This is the end. The next time we hear anything about Joseph and Mary is when Jesus is 12 years old. Yearly, they go to Jerusalem to make this, uh, to offer sacrifices, to offer for the kids and for whatever. This year, one year, he's 12 years old. They go there. It's a big family party. Have you ever traveled with your cousins and aunts and uncles to a big family? That's what they did. Everybody's packed in everywhere. You know, I don't know where my kid is. He's over here. He's over, but everything's safe. So they get back, all the way back down. Oh, yeah, they go up there. They come back down to Jerusalem, do the thing. They go back up, and Jesus is not with them. Jesus is not with them. Where's Jesus? It's like home alone. Like, Kevin, Kevin, but Jesus, where are you? So they don't know where he's at. They don't know. Say, oh, my goodness. Nobody, he's not with you. He's not with you. They go all the way back down to Jerusalem. They went up. They all came all the way back down. And let's see the next passage. Then they're looking for three days. Then after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who hit him, heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When Joseph and Mary saw him, they were bewildered, and his mother said to them, Son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. And he said to them, Why is it that you're looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be, about, had to be in my father's house? And yet they, on their part, did not understand the statement which he had made to them. And he went down with them, came to Nazareth, and he continued to be subject to them, and his mother treasured all these things in her heart, and Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and people. That's all I'm asking you guys to do. There is nothing from 12 years to 30 years about Jesus' life. There's no, nothing to, no handbook on being a teenager. Nothing until he's 30. The only thing he did in that time was this, man. He, as God, subjected himself to his mom and his dad. He did. He didn't say, I'm God, don't tell me what to do. He didn't do any of that. Whatever Joseph was trying to teach him, he learned. He never backtalked him. He never did that. He stayed in favor with God and man. Did you get that? God and man. And I really challenge you guys to consider doing exactly what he did. That's all I'm saying. Okay, next.
I got a piece of paper here. Oh, no, that's not mine. Hey, don't forget next week, come to the Christmas party. Bring an ugly sweater. Bring a friend. Have a good time. Let's close in prayer. Bow your heads. Father, we love you. Thank you for your word. We can learn more about you. Thank you that you give us opportunities to fill ourselves with you, and you give us that this choice and decision. Thank you for that. Uh, help us to uh, prove worthy to be served, to serve others, and to serve you. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Thank you, guys.